Uh, this talk is about, uh, about urban wilderness, about how, how we lost it, um, about how it still exists in, in the hidden corners of our cities, and about how we can bring it back. So when we, when we think about urban wilderness, the first thing that uh, really jumps to mind is the trees. And when we look around, uh, it's easy to appreciate that trees are the, the main source of habitat for most of the biodiversity we have in our cities. And the biodiversity is the stuff that produces the ecosystem services that we all benefit from. When you, when you look up in the trees, you'll see that you know, this is where most of our birds breed. And we have our mammals up there. And as trees age, they get more and more valuable. And these ecosystem services that they produce are really, when you stop to think about it, so much of what, what, what we do every day is, is a result of the biodiversity that's producing these things. Even, even in cities, we have uh, you know, uh, cooling of temperatures, and we have all these, uh, you know, the foods we eat. And then we have all these little services that sometimes we forget about, the pollination. And uh, biocontrols are really neat when there's billions of these little microscopic wasps all up in the forest. And they're the main source of insect outbreak control. And then just the, the nature that we all find so enriching. So this is the kind of stuff we, we want to have more of. And so now when we see new, new designs for city designs and stuff, you know, the first thing that you'll see is like half the image is green, right? And, and it really jumps out of you because we, we want to bring this back. And so before we talk about you know, how we can kind of bring it back, it's, it's neat to think about how we lost it. Like we know there was tons, there always used to be bigger fish and bigger trees and everything. And we know that before there were cities, there was usually forests and we had to clear these things. And we'd keep, uh, we'd keep some trees around. And then even the trees that you know, were remaining, a lot of these got hammered by these massive insect outbreaks. And this is a, a famous elm and you can see the people up in the treetops that they go up there once a year and uh, you know, hand pick off all the, all the insects. And partially because of these insect outbreaks and, uh, and what we did when we replanted trees, we wanted trees that didn't have pests, right? So we went to Europe, we went to Asia, and we picked these trees that looked really cool because no one had seen a, these trees before. But one of the main things about them is they, they didn't have biodiversity on them. They were really easy to maintain. Nothing ate the leaves. There was no pests. And, and sometimes even to be sure, you know, we even spray some of our urban areas uh, with pesticides just to make sure there wasn't anything. And we got really good at this. Uh, and, and even when you look around, you'll, this is a common sight. Like you'll see these urban areas with these little shrubs and there's no insects in there. And you'll find all the trees. And when you look at them, a, a lot of them look very similar because a lot of them are, are genetic clones. are all the same thing. And they're, they're actually, They've, uh, they've been developed to, to not have biodiversity. So, but you know, kind of more important than, than how we lost it, it's really what we lost. And, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. I'm going to start at Toronto. This is where I've been doing uh, some urban biodiversity research for the past, past four years. And then, and then work out from there and, and see how, uh, you know, the, the broader picture across North America. Um, so if you take a quick look at the trees we have in, in Toronto, we've got a great urban forestry department. And cities around North America are starting to use this new U.S. Forest Service standard protocol for measuring trees. So you go out there and you, you measure thousands of trees and you can actually get a, an idea of what you have. And the first thing that jumps out is you can see that less than, you know, 40%, less than 30% of the trees we have are native, right? And most of them are non-native. And if you were to look at even the top trees, you can see that these are the top 12 trees in Toronto. And you can see that only four of them and they're all less than 5% are native trees. So the most abundant one there, Norway maple, this is quite a common thing. You could go to just about any city and you would see one in four trees there is a Norway maple. So um, this idea here is a really simple idea. It's shifting baselines. And many of you might have heard of this. It's used in all different kinds of uh, disciplines now. And this guy, Daniel Pauly, uh, started this up in 95. And it's, it's such a simple idea. It, it makes you wonder why no one really appreciated it before. And, and all he says is that you have some good thing. It could, be, it could be anything. It could be fish. It could be diversity of anything. And over time, it, it goes down. But we, we kind of forget how much used to be there, right? So we usually kind of think one generation behind us. Like, how, how big were the fish? Well, my dad used to catch them this big, but your grandpa used to catch them this big. So he applied this to, to global fisheries. And he, he went around the world. And they got hundreds of years of, of uh, fisheries data. And they actually found that over time, the diversity of fishes in the oceans 
goes down over time. So right now, the average size of the fish we're catching is like this big, and back in the day, it used to be a lot bigger. So this got me thinking about you know, how this, this idea would apply to the urban forest. And you know, do we find the same thing in the urban forest? Are, 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 are tree diversity and native trees going down over time? And two things we can, uh, uh, we can look at. I mean, this is, you know, this is another idea of the shifting baseline. Like, we know that used to be big trees. I don't know if you can see this guy in, in the bottom there, but sometimes we really forget the magnitude of, uh, of the impacts we've had. And it's important to, to look back and appreciate these things. This is just one of the few examples I can find, uh, recent examples with trees. And this is in, in California. And they asked kind of, well, how many oaks do they have there? And if you look in like 2010, there's 112 trees. And then a half a century ago, there was only 313. So if you were just kind of like, well, how many trees are there? You know, we have, we've maybe only lost half. But if you look back up to, you know, the mid 1800s, there were 74,000 of them around, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to, show some data from Toronto. And I'm going to look at, if you look up there at that pie graph, I'm just interested in, if you were to go out in the forest, how many of the tree species are native and how many are non-native? And then another thing I'm going to look at is this idea of dark diversity. It's like when, when species go locally extinct. So if you got all the trees that are native to an area, and then you go out and you sample and you say, well, how many are there now? How, you know, do we have 100%? Do we have 10%? So in order to do this, um, you know, you need, a, you need native tree maps. So what, what I did is I went around, and right now there's the US uh, Forest Service has 19 of these maps. They have some more, but 19 are currently available with the full data set. So, uh, so I got all these. And back in the 70s, the Forest Service uh, made all these tree maps for all of every you know, 679 trees in North America. And you can upload them onto Google Earth so you can see there's a common juniper. And you could zoom right in there and say, oh, is it native to your town? You know, there's the green ash. There's the wing dome, the choke cherry, the Oregon maple. And, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And then so we'd go into each city, and we digitize the uh, municipal boundary of the city. And then we just go through all those 679 trees one by one, shagbark hickory, it's in. Cucumber magnolia, out. Black oak, in. Tulip tree, out. And you keep on doing that. So after you do that, you know, we can look at so how many, what proportion of our forest is native and, and how much is non-native because we're, we're bringing all this stuff in. So if you look at the report for Toronto, you get 115 trees, right? And then you can compare it to the native list and go, well, how many are native and how many are non-native? And that's what you get, right? So most of the trees we have there are non-native. So 64% of the species in Toronto are non-native and 36% of them are native. And then you can step back and you can do this for the rest of North America. And you, you, can, you can look across the board and you can see up here that there's only two cities in North America that have tree lists that have more than 50% of the species are, are native. And especially some of the cities in the West Coast where the West Coast of North America is quite depauperate in tree diversity, they have very few. Like there's actually only one native tree in San Francisco. They used to have 20. So, you can see this, and then if we go and do the same thing with the dark diversity, we go, okay, so how many trees are there and, and how many is left? So again, this would be all the 73 trees that are native to Toronto. And then we go through that list, and about half of them are gone. And the ones that are gone are like the white pine, you know, the really striking ones, the black oak. And they might be around there, but now they're so rare that you, 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 don't, you can't even find them. So again, we've got about we've lost about 44% of the trees in Toronto. And, uh, and if we step back to North America, we can see that, again, across the board, we're losing our trees. And even some prominent places like Washington, uh, for instance, they've got, out of their 10 oak trees, nine of them are gone. You know, all the four pines are all gone. The, the, American, uh, the American plum tree, which is a really you know, f extraordinary wild fruit, it's, it's no longer, you can't find it there. So, you know, the, pe people know about this generally, right? But they don't really, you know, appreciate the magnitude sometimes too much. But there's a lot of initiatives underway. This is a really interesting one. It's going to be launched this fall after nearly a decade, a decade of research. And what they're going to try to do, they've got this sustainable certification for landscapes. And they want to bring that green back, right? So to have a sustainable landscape, they're like, well, you, you can't use non-native plants. We want you to use native ones, right? And then another thing that's getting launched this fall, which is really interesting, is this the Rockefeller 
Foundation just celebrated their uh, centenary. And when they were thinking about, you know, what can we do for our centenary, they thought, well, you know, with all these global disasters all over and the fact that people are now increasingly living in cities, that resilience is going to be their issue. And in terms of ecology, the main component of a resilient ecosystem is diversity, right? So you can see here, if we don't have our native diversity, we're, we're very susceptible to outbreaks and, and such. I mean, the, the emerald ash borer is, is one insect that a lot of us might have heard about. Uh, it was introduced in Detroit in, in the early 2000s, and there's uh, about 8 billion ash trees in North America, and they think they could all be wiped out in the next, you know, couple decades. So by bringing this stuff back, we're going to get our resilience back. Now, what we did is in terms of, you know, we want the resilience, but there's also these benefits, right, these biodiversity benefits. So four years ago, I set out to go see what the real difference was between a native and a non-native tree in terms of biodiversity. Like, is it just a little bit? Is it like 1%? Is it 2%? So we went around the city, and we were interested in insect diversity and diversity of biocontrol agents in the canopies and, and bird diversity. So we went around and we found a, um, these trees. This is University of Toronto right here. So we went in the, the neighborhood around there and we selected four native trees and four non-native trees. And we got these uh, insect nets. They use these uh, often up north. And we suspended them from the canopies because this is where all the diversity is. It's, it's up there and it's hard to get. So we suspended them from the canopies. And then we would, we would check them once a week. And we bring this stuff down. And uh, it's, it's really tricky to almost convey how much of a difference there is in, in numbers. And it's almost just the visual sometimes works better. And you, you'll take down a native tree. And, and every week, you'd have this. It's like a grab bag of, of, uh, of new stuff. And you have pollinators in there, and moths, and beetles, and all these interesting things. And you pull down a non-native tree, especially if you get something that's really non-native, like a non-native family, like Tree of Heaven is, is a very increasingly common tree in North America. And you pull that down and there's just, there's nothing in there. And if you look at a leaf from one of these trees, there's no bite marks on it, right? If you look at a birch tree or something, and yeah, a native birch tree and you pull down a leaf and you look at it, it's got all these insect bites on it, so. And then we thought, well, if there's not a lot of insects, what about the birds? So we did these big bird surveys. We, we recruited a whole bunch of uh, experts from southern Ontario. And we found areas where you'd have a native and a non-native maple side by side, the same size, same location. And we'd bird it for two hours. So we had a whole bunch of these series of, of, uh, of bird, bird surveys. And, um, and again, we found this neat thing. We found there's more birds. But the thing that we found was really neat is that when you're looking at a non-native tree and you're doing the bird survey, the birds will land in there, almost like they don't know it's a non-native tree. But then they, they, they're there for five or 10 seconds, and they fly away. And when they land in a native tree, they'll, they'll stay there, and they find insects, and they'll plow away. So you know, after four years, we found like, it, it's pretty clear that these trees are at least two times, you know, two times better. So these native trees, and, and, and if you find a street that's all native trees, you're going to find tons of diversity there. And if you, f you go up to a non-native tree, there's just really not much up there. So when we appreciate the diversity of these native trees, and we, we then think that you know, we're really our ecosystems are no longer native, and the native stuff we have is mostly lost, we wonder what we can do. And um, well, there's, uh, I mean, this, this to me is kind of a neat one. This guy is. Uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, he's one of the first guys to really promote using native plants. Because even back in the 40s, they were like, whoa, there's way too much uh, non-native stuff. And so they went and they made High Park. And you know, even now, you could, it would be hard to, to really imagine New York without that park. And so I think the thing is, it's important to, to, to remember that you know, we, we can do this. We can do this on large scales. And, and, and the benefits that we get from bringing wilderness to the cities is, is amazing. And, and in terms of what we can do ourselves is these trees all around. This is one of my favorite trees. Uh, it's a giant white oak in Oakville. And uh, you can still go find these things. And I'm sure most of you probably already know of a large tree around your, your, your house, your neighborhood. And it's really easy to go find these. And this is one neat little story I came across while I was preparing for this talk. This is, uh, this is a tree that owns itself. And it's in Athens, Georgia. And, uh, in the 1820s, this guy, uh, Colonel William Jackson, 
loved this tree so much that he, he actually deeded the tree and all the land for, for eight uh, feet around the tree to itself. And when it blew down in the early 40s, they were, uh, they, 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 they were wondering what they could do. And so they collected some acorns and they grew this. And this is actually now the son of the tree that owns itself. So the hope is, is you can go find you know, your own tree somewhere. You might have it in your backyard. It might be your uncle's place or your school. And go find it. And, and then when you find it, you can collect these seeds. Like tree seeds, are, they produce thousands a year. They're really easy to collect. And then you know, give them to kids, give them to your neighbors, give them to everyone. And, uh, and then get out there and, and plant them. You know, like uh, have a fun job of it. So uh, I think I'll just I'll end with that. And, and I think that it's, uh, you know, by, by teaching the younger people about the diversity we have, uh, these kids will, will grow up to one day be able to appreciate um, the trees we have around. Thank you.